Hey, listeners, before we get into this episode, we wanted to take a moment to address, again, the June 24th Supreme Court decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. This decision stripped away the legal right to have a safe and legal abortion. Restricting access to comprehensive reproductive care, including abortion, threatens the health and independence of all Americans. This decision could also lead to the loss of other rights. To learn more about what you can do to help, go to podvoices.help. We encourage you to speak up, take care, and spread the word. Welcome to Malpractice Podcast. (laughs) Are you ready to get started? Super ready. (laughs) I need to start this episode off by saying that yesterday, well, by the time our listeners hear this, two days ago, was Jess, Jess's wedding anniversary. <laughs> and her wife, Michelle, posted a picture of you on her Instagram story. And it was the maybe the best picture I've ever seen of you. Really? You were, like, glowing. You looked so cute. Wait, let me see. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was so cute. By the way, I'm Sydney. And I'm Jess. And this is Malpractice Podcast. And I don't look at (laughs) Michelle's stories. (laughs) It was very cute. Thank you. Yeah. I was, like, really excited to go to this restaurant, Clark's Oyster Bar. Ooh, I love an oyster bar. In Austin. I know you like it. Okay. Here's something something everyone should know about me. Mm -hmm. I will not make a plan. No. To do anything. Does not love a plan. It's, like, a real Mm -hmm. issue. (laughs) Anyway, in, like, May, I was like, you know what's coming up? Our anniversary. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make a reservation. Yeah. So we go yesterday. I was like super hype. Yeah. It was fine. But I was kind of like disappointed. Really? Okay. Next time you come to Houston, we're going to, this is a free shout out. Ooh. It's called Margo's Oyster Kitchen, but it's inside this big food hall that's like a grown up cafeteria. Oh, I love that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yes. So they also have a wine bar on tap. Yep. Turn up. Which I love that vibe. They'll let you try all the different wines and like pick the one that you like. It's really cool. They're super nice there. But at Margot's, so Eric took me for our anniversary last year. Oh, because you like oysters? Yes. And Eric does not like oysters. Eric doesn't. (laughs) So I ordered like a dozen oysters and then Eric ordered like a steak. And the guy was like, oh, you're not going to share her oyster. And Eric was like, no, I don't really like them. And the guy sat down with Eric and was like, okay, what do you not like about them? And Eric was like, well, they feel slimy like snot. <laughs> they do. I like them. And the them. guy was like, I want you to try some of our charbroiled oysters, and if you don't like them, it's on the house. And Eric loved them. Oh, wow. The food there is so good. The service, the people are so friendly. If you're in Houston, go to Margo's Oyster Kitchen. Sydney never does a free shout-out, y'all. This is I a big endorsement. I never do a free shout-out. <laughs> I love that place. This is major news. (laughs) No one gets free advertising except Margo's and sometimes H-E-B, our local Texas grocery store chain. Oh, yeah. H-E-B is a bop, bop, bop. I will shout H-E-B from the mountaintop. Period. I love (laughs) H-E-B. But yeah, we did that for yesterday. Thank you for remembering my kittenversary. It was so nice. Good. I'm glad you had fun. Also, speaking of kittens... I spent the morning yesterday, I I just took like a mental health day, half day yesterday, and I worked from home. As you freaking should. But also the first thing I did was repotted a bunch of succulents. Oh, because of kittens? Yeah. Hmm. So I put this cactus in a container. I like nestled it. You know, I'm really tender with my plants. I care a lot about my plants. And this morning I woke up and she had uprooted the succulent. And drug it about the house and destroyed it. Aw, Marmy. So I'm a little mad at the kitten today. Marmy, why do you do this? (sighs) You have to expect these things from a kitten, but damn it if I hate it. (laughs) Yeah. Anyway, it'll be fine. Everything's fine. (laughs) Everything's fine. Kitten's fine. No more plants. (laughs) No, no. I have to put all my plants at not kitten level. That's what I'm learning. Yeah. She'll calm down soon. (sighs) She'll get the vibes. Yeah, she'll get the vibe. This is a chill house kitten. This is a lazy house kitten. We don't fuck around with tearing plants out of their homes. Do you want to get into the interview? Yeah. Okay. We are incredibly excited to share this interview with y'all today. We recently spoke with Karen Binder, the director 
of Education and Development for the DNA Doe Project. So the DNA Doe Project is a nonprofit initiative that uses investigative genetic genealogy, sorry, lots of words, early Mm -hmm. morning, (laughs) to identify John and Jane Doe unidentified remains. In five short years, they have become a go-to organization for law enforcement agencies and medical examiners across North America, helping them actually solve cases. Their commitment is that no Jane or John Doe remain unnamed due to the inability of a community to afford the lab work, Mm -hmm. the bioinformatics, or skilled genealogy necessary to identify them. Their mission is truly giving names back to the nameless, which is incredible. So far, they have made or helped make over 60 positive identifications, which means giving all of those victims the dignity and respect they deserve, and 60 families made up of hundreds of people who can finally lay a loved one to rest. Yeah, we absolutely love what they're doing. The DNA Doe Project's all-volunteer research are made up of some of the best investigative genetic genealogists in the industry, giving of their time and talent to achieve the common goal of reuniting John and Jane Doe's with their families and communities. Karen Binder is an investigative genetic genealogist and a registered nurse living in Westchester County, New York. She joined the DNA Doe Project in 2018, which I don't think we said this. They started in 2017, so she was on board very early. She started there in 2018 genealogist and a team leader, contributing to more than a dozen solved cases, including victims of serial killers John Wayne Gacy and Gary Ridgway, the Green River Killer. Her casework has been featured on BBC News, ABC, NBC, Fox, Court TV, in addition to podcasts and digital media. Now she can add us to that list. Karen holds a bachelor's degree in nursing from SUNY Empire State College, as well as a master's degree in nurse midwifery from Frontier Nursing University. Karen is absolutely incredible, as is everyone helping with the DNA Doe Project. And this episode combines three of our favorite topics on this podcast, science, true crime, victim advocacy. So without further ado, here's our interview with the amazing Karen Binder. Welcome, Karen. So my name is Karen Binder. I'm the Director of Education and Development at DNA Doe Project. I run education programs for a DNA Doe Project. So that starts with training our internal volunteers that come on board. I do their initial volunteer training when they um, are added to the organization. And then I will also be running um, our internship programs. We have relationships with one college right now, probably adding on another college in the future. And then most recently, I've started an apprenticeship program which is a four-week program for experienced genetic genealogists to be able to add on investigative genetic genealogy to their repertoire. And then I also um, assist with development. So try to think of ways for us to raise money um, as we're a nonprofit organization, and it's very important that we have proper funding. So that includes um, some fundraising on social media, interfacing with potential major donors, and uh, managing opportunities for grants and corporate donors. And then Um, In addition to all of that, I do what I did at the very start of my relationship with DNA Doe Project, which is I work on cases and I team lead cases. And so our cases are John and Jane Doe cases, unidentified remains who were looking to restore their names and return their remains to their families. And so that's really what I I would say that's my primary role because that's how I started out at DDP. That's amazing. And I um, stalked you on LinkedIn. And so I <laughs> I was like super fascinated with your personal career as well. I don't know if you want to share a little bit about kind of what, what you got your degree in or, you know, degrees and like why you kind of went down this path. I think that's that can be super interesting, too, before we jump into to what DNA Doe does. Sure. Yes. Um, so my day job, I work as a nurse educator. I actually started nursing school when I was 16 years old. So that was my first career. And I wasn't even, I was just a little baby when I started out. (laughs) And then I was a registered nurse bedside for almost 10 years. So probably a little bit over 10 years, actually. So I I have a background in telemetry, ICU, and then the emergency department. I went into healthcare quality for about a year and a half um, during the COVID pandemic. Then after the pandemic, I mean, the pandemic's still ongoing, but I have recently, somewhat recently transitioned to education. So now I 
help do orientation of new nurses. I help run apprenticeship programs and internship programs for nurses. So it's funny because I kind of do some of the same things at my day job as I do at DNA Doe Project. And then I also have a background in midwifery. So in that space that I was working as a bedside nurse, I also went and got my degree in nurse midwifery. So I hold a master's in, in that as well, but I've never practiced as a midwife professionally. That's, That's amazing. <laughs> You're like a superhero. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for your service. I oh, consider everyone you. who serves the public. Thank you so much. I really, healthcare is such a hard space to be in right now. So I feel for all of your listeners that I'm sure are working in healthcare. It's changed so much from when I entered mm. the field. It's a tough space to be in, but it's it's so important. And yeah. we have to keep on turning out nurses and, and good physicians and getting patients the care that they need. Yeah, absolutely. Literally like the most essential jobs. <laughs> and you're training nurses, which means you're like touching everyone's patients essentially, which is super cool. I really like the look on people's faces when they learn something new. And so whether it's I'm teaching them something in nursing or something in investigative genetic genealogy, it's yeah. the same thing. You're showing them a new skill. That's amazing. Yeah. And then in your spare time, you're working with the DNA Doe Project, which is absolutely incredible. On its own would be incredible. But the fact that you're nursing in addition to everything that you do with the DNA Doe Project is, <laughs> is just Honestly, it's mind blowing. So can you tell us, so we've, we've given a brief background, but can you tell our listeners just the rundown of what the DNA Doe Project does? Sure. So the DNA Doe Project uses DNA, advanced DNA testing called investigative genetic genealogy to identify John and Jane Doe's. So if you think about traditional DNA testing, that's been around for, you know, dozens of years now, that is DNA testing that works with a closed family member reference sample. So if I have a John or a Jane Doe, I can take their DNA. And then if I have a family member reference sample, like their mother or father, I can compare those two using traditional DNA testing and find out if they're related. Mm -hmm. In genetic genealogy, we don't need a very close family member reference sample. We're doing an advanced kind of DNA testing where we can identify third, fourth, fifth cousins of a John or Jane Doe. And then we can engineer their family trees, look for connections between them, and then build back down the family tree to find the John or Jane Doe. Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing that has been solving cold cases left and right lately, mm -hmm. um, but we're applying it not to suspects. We're not looking at killers and um, rapists. We're looking at the, the John and Jane Doe's. And the goal is to return them to their families because they are always missing people. Right. They are almost always having somebody that's been looking for them all this time. So, yeah. And, and it's kind of speaking on that too. When you think about the DNA Doe project, it like picks up where people are like giving up or could have like given up, but there is that one person who's like always looking for them. Right. Do you often find that people come to the organization in like desperation or are they super hopeful or is it kind of a mixed bag? So the people that come to our organization are really the agencies involved in the cases. So um, medical examiner's offices and um, law enforcement offices. So these folks have usually been trying to identify the John or Jane Doe using traditional means for years. Wow. We've had cases from the 1960s. I mean, our really, really our oldest case was a pre-Civil War case, John Doe. So That's so cool. There are some really old remains. But, you know, some of the ones that I personally worked on were from the 1970s and 1980s. And typically, if you find remains of an individual, then they're going to be identified pretty quickly. They're going to have an identification on them. If not, maybe they'll have dental records. They'll have been reported missing and can be matched to a missing persons report. In these cases, all of those things have been tried and, and failed. Mm. And so this is sort of like the last ditch effort that comes in to identify the John or Jane Doe after all of those traditional methods have been tried. And um, often we're quite successful. That's amazing. Yeah. And so can you tell us That's awesome. how and why? I know it's not it's not super old. You guys started in 2017. But can you tell us how and why the DNA Pro Doe Project got started? Yes. Um, today is actually our fifth birthday. So it's a very exciting day today. Happy it birthday. is like, oh my gosh, happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. Um, today was the first, today was the day that the biologic sample for our first case ever, which was Joseph Newton Chandler, the third shipped out to the labs on July 10th, 2017. 
I wasn't part of the organization at that time, so I'm going to tell you the, the lore. Margaret Preth and Colleen Fitzpatrick, who were our, our founders of DNA Doe Project, had looked into applying this after using the same sort of techniques for adoptees. Margaret Press had actually read a book by the mystery writer Sue Grafton, and it was about a Jane Doe case. And Mm -hmm. uh, when she was reading that, she thought to herself, because she had helped adoptees using genetic genealogy, she thought to herself that Jane Doe's are also people that could get their identities back using the same technology. So then came the hard part, from what I understand, finding a lab that could process remains, human remains, into the kind of file that we need to perform genetic genealogy. And then we're only limited to a certain number of databases. At that time, we could only use one database, which was GEDmatch. And so Joseph Newton Chandler's partial remains were sent to a lab on July 10th of 2017. Later that year, they received the first um, file for his genetic genealogy, and uh, he was uploaded to GEDmatch. And then they were still working on that case when I came on board in February uh, 2018. And I believe it was solved within a a couple of months after that. That's amazing. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about GEDmatch and how that works and how people can participate with that if they want to? Absolutely. So all the time I hear this and it's a myth. So I hear all the time, oh, they solved that case using Ancestry and 23andMe. Nobody ever solved a case using those databases. And so it's a, if you hear that, it's wrong. <laughs> so um, investigative genetic genealogists have access to two databases, and those are GEDmatch and Family Tree DNA. GEDmatch is the first one that was ever used for this type of work. It is a sort of like a crowdfunded, you could say, database. All of the DNA matches that are in there are people like you and me who go and download our raw DNA data from Ancestry or 23andMe, and then we upload it into GEDmatch. So, Mm -hmm. you know, crowdsourced. And then Family Tree DNA is a direct-to-consumer database. So you can order a Family Tree DNA kit online and you spit in it and then you send it in and then they tell you who your DNA matches are. So those are the only two databases that allow for law enforcement uploads. Between them, they have about 3 million users total because there's 1.4 million in Family Tree and 1.5 million in GEDmatch. So that gives us a pretty good sample, but not nearly as good. If, if we could have access to Ancestry and 23andMe, mm. cases would be getting solved even faster. So um, we don't have access to those. Yeah. Uh, however, it is so helpful when people do upload to GEDmatch in particular, because GEDmatch is really the one that is the most accessible for law enforcement. And on, on GEDmatch, we at DNA Doe Project can see all of the available matches for our John and Jane Doe cases. Oh, wow. For John and Jane Doe's, there's no opt-in, opt-out thing that uh, that we wouldn't be able to see those matches. And so it's really, really helpful when people upload into there. And I guess now is as good a time as any to talk about underrepresented populations. Yes. So I'll just share about a couple of cases that I'm that I've worked on or am working on. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> I have... A couple of cases that I'm working on that are cases of Caucasian people. And Caucasians' DNA is very well represented in in GEDmatch. People of European populations love to DNA test. We love to say, like, I'm 30% Irish and 20% English and 4% German, you know? Um, So those are the the populations that DNA test a lot. And they're willing to upload to these third-party databases, too. So if I have a Caucasian case, I know that I'll probably have pretty good matches Unless it's a recent immigrant, like somebody uh, from Norway or Sweden, and they've, they've just come over here in the last couple of generations, that might be a more difficult case to solve. Mm-hmm. However, um, other populations, especially our Hispanic cases, African-American cases, these are very difficult to solve. And that's partly because of underrepresentation in the DNA matches. So if you have an upload of a kit of a person of color, they're just going to have fewer matches and more distant matches than a Caucasian person. In addition, um, when it's an African-American case, you also have um, enslavement of people, making it really difficult to build back those family trees as far as that, right. as far as you need to go. If you're building back my family tree of my American side of my family, I can easily find records going back to the 1700s. If you're looking at um, a case of an African-American person, you're going to hit enslavement and not be able to build back those those DNA matches any farther. 
because unfortunately the family trees have been broken by enslavement of people. So those cases are really difficult to solve. And so the closer and more matches we have in the DNA databases, the better chance that we have to solve them. Yeah, that 100% makes sense. So in terms of So I'm a biologist. I'm not by any means like a genetic genealogist. So correct me if I'm wrong. But my understanding is that with forensic or investigative genetic genealogy, really, the work that you can do and the matches that you can find are kind of defined by your reference database. Like, if you don't have as many people in that reference database, then it's really, really difficult to to make a match if you don't have anything to match it against, right? Exactly. So there's really very little that we can do with a case if there's no DNA matches. To give an example, I have a case of a young girl who is of Hispanic heritage, and she has DNA matches uh, from Mexico and from Peru. And they're all so distant that I know that even if I built out all of their family trees, you know, as far as I can go, I'm not going to find connections between them, which is what we really need to be able to figure out where the Jane or John Doe is in the family tree. Um, so even if I build out all of those matches, I'm not going to be able to find mm. the what I need to, to identify the young girl. Um, so what we do in those cases sometimes when we have really low matches is we provide information about where they're from. So with this girl, maybe we'll say um, that her DNA matches are Mexican and Peruvian. And then maybe her family or a friend will say, oh, yeah, I know a girl that went missing around the same time and she was half Peruvian. I'm going to I'm going to call the police and tell them. So there are other things that we can still try to do. But having the DNA matches in the database is the most important, the most important indicator of of whether or not we're going to be able to solve the case. That 100 percent makes sense. I'm really glad that you brought up the idea of you know, 23andMe, Ancestry.com, they're not selling your genetic information, right? GEDmatch is voluntary. GEDmatch is something you can and should participate in for our listeners. If you're interested in helping with this kind of crowdsourcing effort, GEDmatch is something that's like pretty easy to participate in and you could be like making a huge difference. You really could. And so um, we actually, we went to an event this year called CrimeCon. Mm-hmm. And I know it sounds a little funny to people that haven't heard of CrimeCon before. Um, it's a convention for true crime mm-hmm. enthusiasts. And um, I'll be honest, when I first, you know, went, when I decided to go to it, I was like a little bit skeptical. What are the fans going to be like? Um, mm. But it's a, such a positive space. And everybody that was attending really wants to help with cases. And so what we did was we set up um, a little DNA dough matching station at our exhibitor booth that we had there. And people could come to us and tell us their GED match kit number. And we would run their kit number against 12 featured cases that we had and tell them if they're a match to any of the John or Jane Doe's. And it was really, really popular. And even if people were like a very distant match, Mm -hmm. I would say that a valuable match is anything over 20 stenomorgans. I've done things with with matches that are less than that, like 18 or 16 before, but 20 is really kind of like the threshold. And there were probably no matches that were greater than 20 at this convention, but people were still so excited to participate. And, um, and even if they had like a little tiny segment that they shared with a John or Jane Doe, Mm -hmm. that does indicate like a common ancestor. It might be a thousand years ago, but you know, somewhere you have something in your DNA in common with this John or Jane Doe. And people were really happy to help. And even if they weren't a large match to any of those 12 cases that we featured, they might be the match that breaks the case in another one of our, we've got, you know, 150 cases that we've worked over more than that. It's actually up to the 170s now. So even if you're not a match to the featured case, you might be a match to one of our other hundred and something cases that we're working on. So after that, it was, it was so popular. We decided to take that show on the road. And so now on our social media, every month, we have a feature case of the month that we post (laughs) and people can submit their kit number on this form that we have set up. And then I go through and I run their kit numbers against our John or Jane Doe. And then the people can find out if they're a match at the end of the month, I post the results and it's all anonymized. So I'm not posting, you know, anybody's names or anything like that but they have a little screen name that they've made up and then um and then they get to know whether or not they were a match and so i'm hoping that that will 
increase participation in the database. And I always tell people, make sure that you read the terms of service and that you're prepared for any surprises because a lot of people do get surprises when they take a DNA test and maybe they didn't want a surprise. But Mm. it's one way that you can help solve a case for free. Like you can really make an impact by having your DNA data in GEDmatch. And not everybody wants to do that and that's okay. But if they do want to, they're invited to participate. (laughs) Yeah. That's so interesting that you brought up the idea also of surprises because I think one of the snippets that they took in another podcast that you did, I heard you uh, say the sound bite, uh, mama's baby, daddy's a maybe. <laughs> yeah. And I, I know of some people actually who have had some some interesting surprises come up. And we covered a case a few years ago. We covered a case where people found out that their sperm donor had actually been their their uh, their mom's gynecologist yeah. because of things like this. So so it's really interesting that, you know, DNA is making this this information so accessible. Yeah, it is shockingly prevalent, like shocking. And I, I always say, I, I feel like my, uh, my partner that I always work cases with, her name's Harmony. Um, she also is one of the partners of, um, my LLC that we run now, but she and I always get these like unlucky cases. And I always say we never solve a case without solving a misattributed parentage event first Oh wow! being like a mama's baby, papa's maybe situation. Every single time it happens, we always have to solve one of those to get to the bottom of the case. And it is so prevalent. And I just, I can't believe it. Cause I feel like it's a bold move to, um, Super bold. pretend somebody else's kid is, uh, your husband's kid, but it happens all the time. It happens a lot. <laughs> yeah, I believe that. Families are complicated. <laughs> <laughs> How many cases do you have currently that you're like working and it's run mostly by volunteers, all by volunteers? Like, how does that work? The genetic genealogists are volunteers. So the majority of the work that goes into solving any case is all volunteer. Wow. That's amazing. It's around 180 cases that have ever been in our, in our pipeline. Um, we have over 80 solved cases. Wow. We're actively working on probably 40 or 50 right now. And then we've got some in the, in various stages of the pipeline of the lab pipeline right now as well. That's amazing. It started out with maybe like five or six volunteers. And now we've grown to over a hundred that touch our organization in some way. And about 80 of them are, are active genetic genealogists. That's incredible. And we wouldn't do it if we didn't love it. Like as you've, as you've learned, this is my, yeah, uh, my second job. And I still put in dozens of hours every week because mm-hmm. we love to do it. Well, it's making a huge impact. It's so clearly a passion project for you. Yeah. So totally. can you walk us through kind of start to finish, who typically comes in? Like, how do you typically get involved in a case? What are the next steps? Walk us through it, if you don't mind. Sure. So um, usually we are a tool in the law enforcement tool belt. So they they come to us after they've exhausted all other options. As we mentioned, they're going to try traditional DNA testing first. They're going to try dental records identifying people based on their characteristics, all of that stuff. When that fails, then they reach out to us and speak with our director of case management and our director of lab and agency logistics Mm -hmm. to figure out what the best way to go forward with DNA testing is. So sometimes if they've already done DNA testing, they'll have some leftover extract from the previous DNA testing, and they can send that for genetic genealogy testing. Otherwise, we'll have to arrange for extraction from whatever remains that they have available. So sometimes that is, you know, tissue, it could be blood, it could be bone, it could be teeth, it could be hair. Mm-hmm. any any tissue that they have to identify these remains. Once the lab process is complete, I won't exhaust you with um, extraction, sequencing, bioinformatics, all of that stuff has to happen. Yeah. And then the genetic genealogists come in. And the two main things that we look at, one is the ethnicity or admixture report. And that is the thing that um, I was referring to where you see the percentages of things. So in GEDmatch, it usually says something like 9% Western Europe or... 10% Baltic. It, it gives us these um, breakdowns of the ethnicity. Mm-hmm. And then the thing that we really want, what we're looking for is the list of DNA matches. So uh, that's just a list, just like you see on Ancestry or 23andMe. The first thing that you see on there is your list of DNA matches. 
just provides the DNA matches to our John or Jane Doe mm -hmm. and the amount of DNA that they share with the John or Jane Doe. Sometimes it also has other information, like whether they also share X DNA, which is um, DNA shared on the X chromosome. It might include their mitochondrial or Y DNA haplogroup. Um, it might include whether they're male or female, and it might also include uh, when they uploaded their kit. So there's some information that we get about the DNA match. And then we have to then identify the DNA matches and build their family trees to find how they're connected to the John or Jane Doe. Mm -hmm. And that's really the bulk of our work is that process, finding the DNA matches, building their family trees, and looking for connections between them. That's amazing. And what is a common hiccup that you might run into with a case like you mentioned already, like you have to solve maybe parenthood <laughs> before, <laughs> yeah. before something else. Is there another common kind of hiccup that you run into? So yeah, misattributed parentage is the most common hiccup, I would say. I mean, a lot of people that take DNA tests, they're doing it because they're adopted or because they have a surprise in their family tree. And so a lot of people that are on GEDmatch or family tree DNA um, we might build out their family tree and then be like, huh, this doesn't look quite right for what we're supposed to be seeing. And then, you know, we can sometimes figure out that they're adopted. Um, and that's why their family tree doesn't match what we're seeing. A lot of the time consumption of building out DNA matches is just finding out who they are. So when we look at a DNA match list, it tells us the amount of DNA that they share with our John or Jane Doe. It tells their email address that they're using on GEDmatch and their alias that they're using on GEDmatch. Most people don't have a family tree attached. So then like we have to go find their family tree. So I would say that that's maybe not necessarily a hiccup. We can usually find them pretty fast, but it would be so much easier <laughs> if everybody attached a family tree. Yeah. So if anybody's listening to this podcast and they're going to go upload to GEDmatch right after this, attach a family tree, make it easy on us. <laughs> fair. So this is the way that I like to explain it. If you have me and let's say that I'm, I'm the Jane Doe here, you put my DNA into Jed match, and then you find a couple of first cousin matches. That would be a dream scenario, but, mm. and one of them is my cousin, Christina. And the other one is my cousin, Matt. You build back their family trees. You're going to go back and you're going to find each of their parents. And then you're going to find their grandparents. And then that's going to be the common ancestor is our grandparent. Mm -hmm. And then if you build back down, you'll see that those grandparents had four kids and then you can put all their kids in the family tree. And then you can guess which one of them is me, maybe based on the DNA matches on my other parent side. So that's what we're looking for is the connections between the family trees, which we call common ancestors. Mm -hmm. Very cool. I mean, I've done a little bit of genealogy work on my own family. Does it ever involve things like you're on findagrave.com trying to figure out which of the family members is, is still living? Do you ever end up contacting them? Anything like that? So we usually don't contact any family members at all, because any, any DNA matches or family members, because we wouldn't want to accidentally make a death notification. So we wouldn't want to accidentally contact a person that has the, a missing family member. And then I see. we're the ones telling them. Law enforcement always contact our candidate's family members if we come up with a candidate for the John or Jane Doe. Mm -hmm. When we're building downlines from a common ancestor couple, we're definitely looking for any candidate that could be the John or Jane Doe. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes we're reading obituaries to find out who is living and who's deceased and um, conducting proof of life searches to try to find out if anybody was in the right place at the right time to be this John or Jane Doe. And then sometimes we're taking pieces of the puzzle that don't fit. A lot of times our John and Jane Doe's have been named as living in obituaries because, you know, they were a missing person. So they're family member still listed them as living. And then we have to try to figure out, you know, when was the last time that they were seen alive? Mm -hmm. A lot of um, searching obituaries, searching newspapers. And um, mm -hmm. a couple of times we've yeah. done things in real life. I've had to do yearbook searches um, at my local library and real estate record lookups at my local library as well. So sometimes we're doing that really deep dive genealogy stuff as well. No kidding. Wow. That's amazing. Can you get into um, maybe one or two of your favorite success stories with the organization? I guess my favorite one would be the first one that I ever set out to do. So as I mentioned, the first case I worked on was the Joseph Newton Chandler case. But the first case that I uh, was the team leader for was the case known as Lyle Stevick. Um, this was a young man who took his own life in a hotel room in 2001 in Washington State. And it's actually how I came to be part of DDP, because 
uh, I was doing a lot of stuff online, trying to research that case. As many armchair detectives do, I was looking up uh, missing persons cases to see if any of them match him. I was doing things like trying to find out where he got his boots from, how many stores sold those boots and trying every way but DNA, because of course I didn't have access to that, um, to identify this young man. And then um, on the subreddit, that I was part of. Are, are you guys familiar with Reddit? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I was spending a lot of time on Reddit and Margaret and Colleen, the founders of DNA Doe Project, posted on there and they mentioned that they were looking for volunteers that had experience with adoption um, searches using DNA. And my mother is adopted. So after her, after I solved her adoption using um, paper trail genealogy and then added on DNA later to solve her father's side, I helped other adoptees who were related to her and then some in uh, DNA groups on Facebook. So I had some experience, definitely not as much experience as I have now. And I joined the DDP in early 2018. And then the first case that I was assigned as team leader was the Lyle Stebbett case. So I felt incredibly fortunate to be part of that. And we identified him uh, later in 2018 and provided those long awaited answers to his family. So it was really an important thing to be part of and something that so many people wanted to be part of. And so I definitely recognize um, how fortunate I am to be able to work with DDP. And since that was my first case with my genealogy bestie, Harmony, that is also another reason why I am so attached to that case because she's one of my best friends now and we work every case together. So that's a really important part of it as well. And then another one that stands out in my mind is uh, Wendy Stevens, who used to be known as Bones 10 Jane Doe. She was a victim of um, Gary Ridgway, the Green River Killer. Mm -hmm. She was really, really young. She was 14 years old when she was killed. I think like a lot of women, Many of us have had risky upbringings or um, been placed in positions that made us unsafe. And I, it was really like the case that touched me the most because it was so tragic that her life was snuffed out so early. And, um, and I feel like a lot of our Jane Doe cases, it's just not fair what women go through sometimes. It's not fair. Yeah. And um, so her story resonates with me a lot as well. Yeah, I've I came into contact with the DNA Doe Project because we are huge true crime fans. Both of us listen to a crazy number of true crime podcasts. We often cover true crime topics here. And I was thinking about doing the case. Um, well, I, I was kind of oscillating between two, the Marcia King, the Buckskin Girl case. And then Deborah Jackson, the um, Orange Sox case was in, in Georgetown. And we're both from Texas. Mm-hmm. So... I kind of got into this idea of genetic genealogy because we were researching these cases. You're you're 100 percent right. It's it's so unfair sometimes, I think, how long families wait for these answers. But to me, I'm so touched by, by the idea that you guys are giving people that final closure that they need to to move on with their lives and to, you know, bid their loved ones farewell because I can't think of anything worse than just not knowing. Yeah. So many of them went through a lot before they ever disappeared. And so many of them came from families who also went through a lot, came from mothers that went through a lot. So it's sort of this like generational trauma and we discover it because we're doing the genealogy. This is why I like genealogy because it's if walls could talk, but they kind of are talking because we're able to see what happened and we see the stories of the families play out and we're getting some answers, not all the answers, but some. So it's kind of, I don't know, therapeutic in a way, but also also really hard sometimes. Yeah, I believe that. It's an incredible sacrifice, right, to do this work, volunteer for this work, the emotional like labor, as well as the mental labor, the time that you put in, like. I'm just kind of taken aback to the the quantity that you, you and members of the organization are just giving freely to solve like really tragic problems for people's families. Well, I think for me, being a healthcare worker is part of the reason why I'm probably able to do it because I've been dealing with, I remember when I was in nursing school, the first time I ever had a patient that was even sick, like they didn't even, they weren't dying. They were just sick. And I felt so much for them that I went home and cried that night 
And over time in healthcare, you have to build up a little bit of resilience. And um, I wouldn't say like a wall or anything like that, but you just have to have be a little bit removed from, from the emotion of it. And so um, I, I, I think like sometimes in, in this same space where we're doing this genetic genealogy on these tragic cases, you have the time that you set aside to to grieve about it, um, maybe after the case is done, or you take some time to reflect on it. But um, the work has to be done too. And so having the ability to have that ana- analytical mm. part of your brain to do the work um, comes into it. I, I wonder what my colleagues would say though, because I'm sure that we have a um, a whole bunch of different personalities in the group, and probably some of them are more empathic than. I am. And um, I'm sure there are some people that have a more difficult time than I do. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad that you use the word empathy because I since you've started talking, I'm like, it would take so much empathy. Just to be a part of it. And I agree with the idea of compartmentalizing, but at the same time, I think just being involved with it and donating your time to this shows an enormous amount of compassion and empathy. Thank you. I feel like I mean, I just feel lucky to be part of it. So I don't feel like I'm giving up any kind of sacrifice because I feel so lucky to be in it. So I, I guess, I guess, I don't know. I'm just lucky. That's amazing. (laughs) And that's an incredible response to that. So, (laughs) (laughs) If someone were listening to this and thinking that they wanted to help out, what, what would you recommend? Like first steps, what should they do? How can they get involved? Sure. So the first thing that people can do is follow DNA Doe Project on social media. So um, we're at DNA Doe Project on almost every platform. We'll link all of those things. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. And um, so that's the easiest way to share the stories of our John and Jane Doe's. They really do get seen by the right person sometimes. Uh, one of our cases, it was Phoenix Jane Doe, 1997. She was from a region of Mexico. There was a little bit of media done and then her family members saw her and they uh, identified her as Bertha Holguin. Like they saw her online wow. and then they came forward and said who it was. So sharing our stories really does make an impact. That's amazing. Second way to help is what we've talked about with GEDmatch. Uploading to GEDmatch really makes an impact on cases. Doesn't matter what population you're from, there's going to be a case that you are a match to. And if you want to go the extra mile, add a family tree to your GEDmatch profile. To learn how to upload to GEDmatch, you can go to DNA Doe Project's YouTube channel, and um, there's some instructions on how to do it there. And if you are doing that, you can also submit to be compared to our featured case of the month. Um, Every month on the first, we always release the featured case, and you can find out if you're a DNA match to them. A uh, third way to help would be to donate to our organization. As I mentioned, we're a nonprofit organization. Um, when we started out, our costs were very low because we had only a few volunteers. Uh, we only had a few cases. We were only working with a few agencies. Now we're working with dozens of agencies. We have uh, over 100 cases. We try to help agencies with lab fees when they can't afford it. We have platforms that we need to use and we have subscriptions for. We have contracted employees that we have to pay for their services. So um, every dollar really makes an impact. We don't need a whole lot of money, but every donation does make an impact. And it really makes a difference for whether we're able to help cases, help, help agencies bring their cases to us. So those are the main ways to help. And we appreciate every every bit of help that comes our way. And we'll absolutely link to the donate project where people can go donate. So if you're looking for that information, you can find it in our show notes. The other thing is, I love the idea that you guys are are helping out when communities don't have the resources to use these investigative techniques. I I think that's so incredible, especially when you're talking about marginalized communities or people from backgrounds that are are maybe not ideal, it's like those are the communities that need the help. Yeah. And medical examiner's offices, really, I did not know how much um, how much funding is a barrier for that. Oh, wow. And uh, we went to this conference last year and I found out that like there's really very, very little funding for lab testing and advanced DNA testing. If funding was not a barrier so many cases would get solved. That is really like the main thing that prevents agencies from bringing cases to us. So we're hoping that eventually we'll get to the point that we can say, mm-hmm. you know, just bring the case. We'll we'll take care of it. Um, but to do that, we're going to need a lot of funds ourselves. So 
Is there anything that we didn't ask you Yeah, that we should have asked you? I have just one. I have a medical tie-in for you guys. Perfect. Yeah, ready. So I run, I help run our social media pages at DNA Doe Project. And whenever we have a case that has any sort of like medical element to it. So like, let's say it's a Jane Doe who was found and, and has breast implants. Or let's say it's a John Doe and he has a metal rod in his ankle. And we'll get all of these comments that say like, just look at the serial number of the ankle rod and then you'll be able to identify the dough. And I just want to say as a healthcare worker and as an investigative genetic genealogist, we can't do that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So there is no database of every medical device ever used. And I just asked a medical examiner this the other day. She shared with me that if the person has a pacemaker, then yes, there is a database. Um, they can go to Boston Scientific or whoever made the pacemaker and they can find out the, the number of the pacemaker. And then that can be used to figure out who the John or Jane Doe is. But with any other medical device, things are mass manufactured. So there's more than one of one device that has the same number. Oh wow! And there's no database for us to look in and just type in the number of that and then figure out everybody that had this device implanted. Now, if you did have a candidate for the individual, like let's say I know, I I think I know who the John Doe is, and then I pull his medical record, and then I look at what the lot number is of the ankle bone fixator that he has implanted, then that might be some supporting evidence for him to be this John Doe. But there's no, I can't just go to a hospital and be like, hey, can you pull all records of every person that had? <laughs> it's just not a thing. So I wanted to teach everybody that. <laughs> I would love it if it was a thing, but it's not. That would be amazing yeah, it if it like was. it should be. <laughs> it should be a thing. It's just, there's too many types of devices. Like who would keep track of that? And then also when you consider that most of our John and Jane Doe's are found pre- electronic medical record. Mm. I had no idea. That's a good look. I didn't know that. I was kind of of the same mind, like, okay, we'll just look up, (laughs) find them in the database and like, well, who's keeping that database together? The idea of that type of in-depth research is so fascinating and cool. (laughs) And I also, I love the idea. We covered a a genetic genealogy case with the Golden State Killer um, when, when that all went down. It was so interesting the way that things like that go down where it's like these markers, specific markers are so rare that they could only belong to like 2% of the population. And it just happens that, you know, you have a fifth cousin or something that's identified as as having those same markers. I bet a lot of people in the like 70s and 80s who committed crimes back then are looking back like, oh, shit. Yes, I know. I love that. I love the one CC Moore solved a case that... um the the man had googled like investigative genetic genealogy he was googling like because he was scared he was like so, um, <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah it's it's so exciting and um another thing I guess that I should point out for your listeners is um you might think I don't have any missing people in my family so I don't need to do this gen match upload I don't need to take a DNA test because like I don't know there's nobody in my family that's done anything or has gone missing but you only know, you probably only know your first cousin. You probably don't have, you probably can't comprehend your second cousins. You definitely can't comprehend your third cousins. Um, and those matches are the ones that we use to find people all the time. I have constantly um, cases where the best match that I used to identify a John or Jane Doe was a third cousin match or more distant than that. So it's just because you don't know of a missing person in your family doesn't mean that your DNA isn't the puzzle piece that we need to solve a case. I just wish there was a way to notify everybody, like, guess what? Your DNA solved this case because we can't, we can't possibly do that all the time. But if people knew how impactful their DNA is, I feel like they might, they might want to participate. And if they don't want to, again, that's okay. But if they want to help solve these cases, it's a huge way to help. Yeah, that's fantastic. I love that message. Well, you've been really generous with your time as we ask a million questions. We ask all of our guests at the end of uh, every interview one the same question. And that question is, how do you take your coffee? I, I really like only iced coffee. Like, I don't want it hot. Please don't make it hot. Like, I just don't want it. <laughs> but my favorite thing in the world is the Charlie Cold Foam Cold Brew from Dunkin' Donuts. And so I'm a, I allow myself to have one three days a week. <laughs> <laughs> You're speaking my language. <laughs> Jess's love language is iced coffee. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> love it. Yeah. Love it. 
<laughs> well, thank you so much. You're amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah, this has been one of the coolest conversations. Oh, it was so nice talking to you guys. Thank you so yeah. much. We love what you guys are doing and anything we can do to help, we're happy to. Anytime. I can't wait to listen to it. I'm looking forward to it already. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you have any ideas for future episodes and you want to send us a DM with, with that, that's totally fine. We actually love it. Mm-hmm. We read them all. Um, big time podcast host reading <laughs> all of your messages. Don't worry about that. You can DM us on Instagram. On You can send us something on Twitter. You can email us at our gmail malpracticepodcast at gmail.com. I need a coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I have a coffee. Oh, and if you get a chance, don't forget to leave us a review wherever you like to listen. We absolutely love hearing your feedback, unless it's negative. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> it's true. I, I don't have anything to say. It's so true. Anyway, thanks for listening. And don't forget, malpractice, malpractice makes, makes perfect. perfect. Bye. Bye.